Hello and welcome to Swipe, coming to you from the 2014 Consumer Electronics Show here in Las Vegas. On this week's show, Future Fashions, we take a look at some of the wearable tech that's drawing in the crowds. Pocket Lint's Stuart Miles gives us his take on the big talking points at this year's show. TV takeovers, why how we tune in is set to change. And Gaming Glory, we check out some of the best releases that'll get you going in 2014. Well, in case you don't know much about CES, it is the place where once a year, pretty much every big technology brand comes to show the world what they've been working on. And one of the big talking points this year is wearable technology. I've been talking to someone with an interesting perspective on it all. Now, the headline here is all about wearable, and Bethany Simpson uh, is from iMedia Connection in, uh, in Los Angeles, uh, clearly a devotee. First of all, what do you like about Google Glass? Well, I've got some mixed thoughts on Google Glass. I think it's very cool that it's very techy. I mean, it's very insider. When else do you get to use augmented reality out in the regular world? I um, mean, it gets a lot of attention. I've had a lot of people coming up and asking what it is. I thought there'd be a lot more recognition. They'd say, oh, it's glass. But I think it's very early gen. Um, the batteries on devices are a little bit tough, so I don't get a lot of battery life out of glass yet. In fact, they just went dead a few minutes ago or else I'd show you a little bit more of what they could do. Um, the interface is a little bit hard to see. It's a very small little opaque window. You guys might have tried it on. You might have tried it on. Um, this little crystal right here is literally where the display shows up. And so it's just a small little window. And so I look just above my visual eye and that's where I can see a very light transparent menu. Um, I think the actual interaction with Google Glass is a little bit rough at this point as well. I can check up to see what time it is, what the weather is, what interesting things are around me. Um, but I want more augmented reality. I want it to tell me where's the next event at CES, things like that. They say they're going to sell one and a half million wearables this year. Do, yeah. do you think the, 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 the broader public wants this? Could, could you see that there is a use for, for the ordinary folk? Well, I'm part of the geek set myself. And so, you know, a lot of my friends in Los Angeles, of course, we think it's really exciting. Um, thinking from the normal consumer side, I just spent the holidays with my family and whatever they think is interesting, I think that's sort of the bellwether. I think it's early. I think people love to track their fitness. I think that they find it very interesting to engage with their devices. Um, but again, I, th I think it's still more of a, a, a cachet thing at this point. It's more exciting than it is actually usable. I know I heard the numbers are going to be a lot more sales coming up this year than there were last year. Um, but personally, even as an insider who really geeks out on this stuff, I think it's still a little bit early. Of course, it's not all about wearables and for the tech journals who fly in from all around the world to be here for a full on week of reveals and big announcements. There's plenty to see. One man keeping across it all for us is Pocket Lint's Stuart Miles. Here's his video diary. Here I am on day zero of CES. The show hasn't even started yet. I've already seen more wearable tech than I probably most people would have done in a lifetime. It was everything from a toothbrush that monitored and 3D sensed your mouth to well, lots of wearable stuff to track your fitness, to track whether you're eating right, to track, well, track everything. This has been a show of wearables and it hasn't even started yet. So it's been the press day at CES today and that's the chance for all the big boys to start announcing all their products. We've seen major announcements from LG, Samsung and Sony. Stuff that's grabbed my eye, well I got to see a flexible OLED 4K TV from LG. That was quite impressive, it actually changes shape at the press of a button. And then there was the Pepcom which was a chance for the smaller companies once again to show their wares. There we saw everything from a doorbell that was connected to the internet, so you could get a phone call when someone's knocking at your door, and just a menagerie of more wearables from well, everything to tracking your fitness. That is really the big word this week, wearable, wearable, wearable. So I've just got back to my hotel room after a busy first day at CES on the show floor, and it's been pretty crazy. I've seen some really interesting things, including the chance to sit in a four and a half million dollar Lamborghini to test a fifty thousand dollar sound system from Monster. And when they turned the volume up, it made every bone in my body shake. But that wasn't the most bizarre thing I saw today. Probably that award has to go to Intel. I saw two things there in their sort of innovation section. One was a computer the size of an SD card. And the second was a baby onesie that you could connect to the internet to be able to check your newborn child's movement, breathing and temperature. Coming up to the end of day two at CES and I've seen plenty. I managed to get to play with the new Oculus Rift. It's a virtual reality headset that throws you into the game and they've added a quite a new couple of features. 
still a prototype stage, the product hasn't launched yet, but it's looking very exciting. The new features include something called low persistence, which allows you to lean into the shot, as well as tracking your head movements now. I also managed to get to sit in, well, a dashboard of the Audi TT, which is launching later this year. They've tried to do as best as they can to get it all with dials, and instead put all the sort of virtual cockpit, as they're calling it, in the main dashboard area that you normally have. It now changes from dials from speedometers to mapping data to the entertainment and everything else. I think it's really going to be the way that cars move, certainly in the future, and they're going to be a lot more interactive than just a needle that twigs side to side as you go faster. Apart from that, I've also seen a bunch of robots, everything from a window bot that cleans your windows to a grill bot that, grills, that cleans your grill. We are in America after all. So ES 2014 is coming to an end. I'm heading off to the airport. See you later. TV has been another area that has got tech fans talking, as Katie Spencer reports. Samsung's launch of its curved Ultra HD TV has to be one of CES's biggest headline makers, but perhaps not for the reasons originally intended. And um, what I try to do tonight as a director, I try to the auto cue dying was too much for Transformers director Michael Bay to take. Excuse me, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. As he awkwardly left the stage, he sent social media into a frenzy. For manufacturers, standing out in the crowded TV market can be tricky. One of this year's main battlegrounds has been ultra high definition. You are putting four times the amount of pixels in the space that you currently see. So, in a sense, High definition today is 2 million. These sets produce 8 million, giving you a sharper picture and also allows you to sit closer to your TV and still see a wonderful picture. So you can go larger in a smaller space. The move towards Ultra HD has been driven in part by how popular video streaming has become. At this year's CES, Netflix and Amazon both announced plans to show more of their TV shows and films in the format. The other exciting new innovation was over screen shape. Right now, you can buy a curved TV, but if you can't decide if you want it to be flat or not, you can choose with these flexible ones. Curved is supposed to be a more immersive experience when it surrounds you. But why settle for a curved screen when you could have the image played straight onto your eyes? It's called a virtual retinal display. And how that's different from other display technologies is that there is no screen at all. The image is projected directly on your retina. A step too far? Well, that's how many experts now see 3D technology. When it comes to trying to tweak our telewatching habits, predicting what will catch on can be tricky. 3D required completely new production. It required a very different type of production, so you couldn't watch just anything in 3D. And it enforced a new type of viewing behavior on the consumer. Ultra high definition is a true extension of the existing um, way of watching TV. A small step rather than a giant leap. Ultra HD shouldn't feel like that big a departure from what we're used to and because of that many believe the change in quality might just be enough to tempt more of us into buying a new television. Katie Spencer, Sky News. But CES isn't the only tech story we've been talking about this week. Back in the UK, Sky's Neil Patterson has a roundup of this week's tech news. Many thanks, Greg. I'm honestly really so happy for you being over there in Vegas whilst I'm stuck here. Well, anyway, in the battle of the games console giants, the PS4 seems to be leading the way. Sony says it sold 4.2 million consoles by the end of last year and is on track to sell 5 million by the end of March. Well, that's quite a way ahead of Microsoft's Xbox One, which at the last count had only shifted 3 million units by the end of 2013. However, both makers look set to benefit from the news that their products can now be bought in China. The Chinese government has temporarily lifted a ban on selling foreign video games consoles, which obviously opens up a potentially huge marketplace. China banned games consoles back in 2000. There's been a bit of a tussle on Twitter over social media copyright. The debate centres around this tweet by A.O. Scott, who's a film critic in the United States. It ended up being published as a full-page ad in the New York Times. What's more, the tweet itself was edited to this. The critic insists his permission was sought, but he didn't give consent. 
Inside Lewin Davis is one of this year's Oscar hopefuls, which could be why it was edited, as the Academy doesn't allow negative campaigning. Yahoo has confirmed that its European site was infected with malware designed to turn PCs into Bitcoin miners. In a statement, it's admitted that for four days in January, the malware was found present in ads on its homepage. It's thought as many as two million users could have been infected, experts believe, with a view to creating a huge network of mining machines. And speaking of Bitcoin, the developers of a new virtual currency have run into a spot of bother with one of the most well-known rappers in the world. Who'd have guessed Kanye West wouldn't be happy about developers launching the cryptocurrency called Coinye? Well, as well as a little cartoon version of the rapper's face for its logo, the website also has a currency mining programme called Gold Digger. His lawyers have issued a cease and desist letter accusing the site of copyright infringement and trying to profit from Yeezy's public image. Well, back now to Greg in Sin City, Las Vegas, where I'm assured he's having the worst time possible. A new year means new games to get excited about, and we've been checking out a few in this week's Games Review. My first game for 2014 is Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. Now, Metal Gear Rising came out at the, at the beginning of 2013 on Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, and it was a moderate success. Did really well with critics, but not a lot of people bought it. And it's actually a really, really good action game. The focus is on swordplay. It takes place in the Metal Gear universe, which a lot of gamers will really know. This PC edition that's been released um, for, for 2014, it brings together the main game, all of the downloadable content that came out on consoles and loads of costumes for the main character of Raiden and because it's on PC uh, and if you've got a powerful enough PC it looks absolutely beautiful, way better than the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 versions. Uh, it's, it's a relatively short experience, it's a traditional action game, it's not really going to change the world but if you're into Platinum Games previous works or you're a Metal Gear Solid fan it's pretty much guaranteed to satisfy you. Remote piloting and AI wiping have been disabled. There have been literally tens of Mario Party games released across a multitude of Nintendo platforms going across GameCube and N64. And these games, the idea behind them is that they're board games for multiple players, um, with the difference being that when you roll the dice and move certain number of spaces, you land on certain spaces that will initiate a mini game that you play with the other players in the game. And it's, um, it's very much traditional board game territory. Now the 3DS version, um, it's, it's interesting because you buy one cartridge and then you share the game amongst your 3DS owning friends. So if you've got four players, each with a 3DS console, you only need to buy one copy of the game and then that game can be shared wirelessly with friends, which is quite a novel concept, I think, because you only need to buy that, that single copy of the game. My main problem with it is that it doesn't feel like it's a game of skill, it feels like it's a game of chance. It does have some, um, some fun and entertaining mini-games that you can play with your friends, you just need to make sure that your friends own 3DS consoles. Um, Don't Starve was released on the PC uh, last year, and it's a very interesting little indie game that's very different to a lot of other games on the market. Essentially, you're, you find yourself in this cartoon Tim Burton-esque world, um, and you're given no instructions, but you have to sort of forage for items and basically protect yourself from the monsters that come out at night. If you're used to your games holding your hand, this game really doesn't do any of that. It just throws you straight into it. So for that reason, uh, it appeals to me as, a, as someone who likes indie games, who likes games that doesn't that do that do things that haven't been done before. But also bear in mind that it can be quite difficult. So um, it, it's an interesting game. Don't Starve is being released as a downloadable title for PlayStation 4, but it's also part of the PlayStation Plus collection. So it's free if you're a PlayStation Plus subscriber. So if that happens to be you, there's no excuse for not checking it out. The Xbox One finds itself in a similar position to the PlayStation 4 in as much as there's not many new games coming out for it, but I wanted to pick up on one game that was released just before Christmas which is really fun and interesting. It's called Max the Curse of Brotherhood and it's one of those side-scrolling 2D platformers of which there aren't very many at the moment. And the hook in this particular game is that Max has a sort of magic marker that he can use to draw items in the game so he can draw himself a bridge or a water fountain and you use that element and draw things using the control pad to solve solve various puzzles and kill off enemies and do various things in the game, which is a, an interesting mechanic. It's a downloadable title, so it's, it's relatively cheap, about £10 in the UK, and um, there's a lot of game in there, there's lots of worlds to explore, it looks beautiful, 
I really like these side-scrolling platformers, and like I said, there's not many many of them around. And Max is a is a, a charming little game that's very very cheap, so I'd uh, thoroughly recommend it. Well, that's it for this week. Remember, you can catch up with breaking tech stories all week on Sky News for iPad, our smartphone apps, and SkyNews.com. Goodbye from Las Vegas, and we'll see you next time.